Lord, we thank you for this time of worship, worship in music, worship through listening, through receiving your word. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would receive this time as an offering to you. We dedicate this time into your hands. It's yours, Lord. We're here for you, not for ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray. I'd like to begin this message a little bit differently. We've started this way in a few sermons, but haven't done this for a while. I'm going to begin with a spoken word poem. If you ever feel too stressed, or you ever feel like your life is going too quickly, you're trying to slow down, but you're sort of afraid to stop. Maybe you feel kind of like, like you're spinning all these plates and you're afraid if you stop for one second, they're going to crash and break. And maybe you can kind of relate to this poem and uh, the person in this. This poem is about restless activism. It's about a person who feels caught in this cycle of ceaseless action. This poem is called Can't Unplug. Can't Unplug. Blaring iPhone chimes say I have to wake up. My eyes are exhausted. Snooze, snooze, kitchen, drink a cup. More coffee and traffic, clenched hands in my car. Radio talk brings sad news from afar. At work, stamp the clock, tick tock. Needy Facebook notifications follow. A note of expectation from my boss, tough to swallow. 37 unread emails. I should have gotten up earlier trying to focus, but my mind's at home. I'm a worrier, and it seems like I can't unplug. 10.30 a.m., five texts from my spouse. Didn't I pay the electric on the house? I swipe through a few notified tweets. The morning drags by, and it's time to eat. Munch a short lunch in the corner. Try and catch up on my show alone. Head down, eyes glazed, inches from my phone. I can't unplug. Oh no, I forgot to call mom last night. Her familiar wrath should ensue tonight. My pulse races, thinking of dad's weak heart. When did I schedule his new insurance to start? I'm more tired in the afternoon than I was at five in the morning. Finally, work stops at six. The real work starts at six. Grubhub saves my life, but it takes tips. I fall up the stairs at home. Financial pressures squeeze me. 401 updates have lately displeased me. I check the, sca the status again and again and again. I can't unplug. Called my daughter three times with concern. No call back. The early evening starts a pain in my head and low back. Buzz, buzz, my friends want to go out, but my spouse is angry. Twenty years of frustrations also plague me. Everyone wants more. I want to drop to the floor. I am trapped, and I can't unplug. 11.30 at night, I turn out the lights. Alone in the bed, things better unsaid, and those creeping concerns assail me. Sleep escapes me, speed encages me, my mind is racing and I can't keep pace and I'm exhausted now and I'm not faking. The seasons fly by, swirling green leaves fade and die until blaring iPhone chimes say I have to wake up. I can't un. Do you ever feel like the person in this poem? <laughs> Do you ever feel like you can't unplug? In the United States of America in 2018, we have a culture of restless activity. We have this culture of a rising demand for action. We have to try every new restaurant. We have to read every email. We have to respond to every text. We have to make more friends, but also make more money, but also take more vacations. There are so many things that we have to do. We have these email alerts and push notifications constantly interrupting us, demanding our attention again and again. 
We have bills to pay, important checks to cut, urgent reports to write and calls to make, all this pressure and our culture says, do, do, continue to work, push, 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 push. But maybe like many, you are beginning to discover that this glamorized 21st century culture of action is not really fulfilling, but it's draining your spirit. And we find that we are doing many things, but we are living very little. In the midst of this culture, which is so demanding for our action, the Lord is also calling to us. The Lord is calling us. And our culture is about activity, but the Lord is about worship. And the Lord is calling us into worship in the midst of a demanding culture. We are now in our fifth message in our worship series, True Worship, as we're trying to discover, to understand, and to enter into true worship. And here's the question I want you to think about today. Realizing our intensely active culture, realizing this culture demanding us to do so much, how do we worship the Lord? Specifically, how is the Lord calling us to worship Him in an actively demanding culture? We feel tired often. We feel aggravated. We feel stressed. How can we worship the Lord in that? How are we supposed to worship the Lord when everything wants our attention? Here's the big question. It should be up on the screen for you. Here's the big question of our sermon. How am I called to worship in a restless world? How am I called to worship in a restless world? And you know where we're going to find the answer. We're going to begin to discover the answer to this question in Psalm chapter 46. So take out your personal paper copy of the scriptures. Open up to Psalms chapter 46. Psalms chapter 46. Before we dive into the text, we're going to pray together in just a minute. Psalm 46. Here's what you can expect in today's message. In today's message, we're going to look at this psalm. It's a psalm of the sons of Korah. And we're going to discover three steps to worshiping in a restless world. Three steps to worshiping in a restless world. Two are internal, kind of like prerequisites. Two are inside what has to happen in you. And then one is the actual action of worship. Uh, so two, three steps to worship. Two are kind of an internal, internal um, condition. And then the third is an action, the action of worship. How do we worship in a restless world? Before we begin to dive into that text, let's pray together. We're going to pray for opening. Lord, we thank you that you, Jesus, can open every door. We thank you, Jesus, that you can open every heart. Nothing is closed to the Lord. And so now we ask, Lord, that you would open the hearts of every person here, that you would open my mouth, that as we open your word, that you would open the heavens and that we could receive from you. I pray against distraction in the name of Jesus because some are very distracted. I pray for attention. I pray for focus. I pray that you would speak, Lord. Thank you. We know that you will. I give it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 46 is a psalm of the sons of Korah. The sons of Korah were Levites who conducted worship in the temple area. They were kind of like Israel's worship leaders. And we don't know the exact context of this psalm. It was maybe perhaps in the reign of Solomon. But in the psalm you see that the sons of Korah are kind of talking about this like restless, raging world. And there's like these storms and wars and all these evil things going on. But then there's this one place which is a refuge and a sanctuary. And in that place there is security. In the book of Psalms, in the 46th chapter, I'm going to read verses 1 through 11. Psalms chapter 46, verses 1 through 11. God is our refuge and strength, 
a very present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord. He has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. How do we worship in a restless world? Worship in a restless world begins with having a different mindset than the world. You have to be able to be present, to be in a very similar condition, to almost be in the same place, but to look at the world in a different way. You have to have a mindset like like the citizens of the Golden City. Let me tell you a story. Once upon a time, there was a beautiful Golden City in a distant land. It sat atop a hill, beautiful and shiny. But, this, but the land that the Golden City was in was a sad and miserable place. The skies over that land was, were bronze. They were hard and heavy. They were dark constantly with storm clouds. And the rain and the hail would pelt that land. And the lightning would shock. And the people of that land were no better than the skies. They were a dark, dreadful people. They lived in warring tribes. Their villages were always in conflict and bandits guarded every road. These people lived a sad, fearful life. And they hid themselves in the caves of the mountains and even in holes in the ground. But there was one place that was different in all that country, and that place was the Golden City. Within its shining metallic walls, The Golden City was a completely different environment. There, within the Golden City, there was this majestic king who ruled over the city. And the king had been given wisdom like Solomon and power from on high. And through his careful strategies and calculations and prayers, that city was well secured. Though the storms raged around the cities, it seemed like the clouds always broke over it. Though the rain fell almost night and day on the land, the rain never fell on that golden orb of the city, only as much water as they needed. When some horrible event occurred in the land, like some pestilence or disease, or a neighboring country invaded the land, and all people of the countryside quaked and trembled with fear, the people in the city were not afraid because they knew that their king was with them and their king would let no harm befall them. They were safe in his golden city. How do we worship in a world of restlessness, in a world where there's all this danger and fear surrounding us? Worshiping in a restless world begins with having a different mindset. Psalm 46 verse 1 says, The Lord is our refuge and our strength. He's a very present help in times of trouble. Worshiping in a restless world begins with a mindset of security. Begins with a mindset of security. You have to be able to look at the world and look at the storm around you and to be able to know that you are safe. That you have the mindset of security in the Lord. 
What is it that motivates? Sorry, we're going to shut off that vent. We're going to be in a new building in like a month, and we are so excited, are we not? Yeah. What is it that motivates ceaseless restlessness? What is it that makes us restless? Think about it. What makes you restless? What is it? We can answer that in a lot of different ways, right? There's a lot of different motivations. But I think if we look at the really big picture, we could say that there are two motivations for restlessness. The first is desire, right? Like you want things. You're hungry. You're thirsty. You're desirous for more. You want more success. You, you desire something. And so your desire motivates you to keep going and keep going. You're like a little child who won't go to bed for lack of one more game. Like your desire motivates you and it makes you restless. However, joy can only keep us jumping for so long. Your pleasure can only keep you moving for so long. And I think in the end, there's actually a bigger motivation. You see, pleasure cannot produce the haunting restlessness that we're plagued with. I think the real motivation for our restlessness is fear. It's fear. Pleasure is like a lover beckoning you forward, but fear is like an enemy with a knife to your back, probing you on. I check all my emails because I'm afraid I might miss something. I can't stop looking at my phone because I'm afraid there's going to be that important text. I work all those overtime hours because I'm afraid I won't make enough money. I can't stop calling or texting my family because I'm afraid I'm going to be a bad father or mother. I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. And my fear works in my mind and it works into my life. I see every shadow as a raging disaster. I see these sad news stories and I project them onto my life and I find myself vulnerable and weak and I see myself as fearfully insecure. I am restless because I am fearfully insecure. But the Lord speaks to my trembling heart and He says, you are that's what the psalm is saying, right? The Lord says, I am your refuge. I am your strength. I am the shield over you. I am the walls about you and the foundation beneath you. I am with you and therefore you do not have to be afraid. You don't have to fear because the Lord's presence is upon you. How do we worship in the restless world? It begins with a mindset of security with being able to know that I am safe. You are safe in the golden city of your God. And the mindset of security begins to change your heart. There's a story in Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 51, about Jesus and his disciples. And it's kind of similar to the story we talked about a few weeks ago about Jesus walking on the water, but different. One day as Jesus was finishing his ministry in Galilee for the day, he taught all these crowds, but it was evening and the crowds were evaporating. Jesus and his disciples stepped into a boat and began to cross to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. There, I imagine, the calm sea, a gentle breeze puff puffing against their faces, and Jesus was tired. He'd done this long day of ministry. He was very tired. So he kind of moved to the back of the boat. And in the back of the boat, there was this cushion or like bed of some kind. And I imagine Jesus plopping down on that cushion and quickly and quietly falling asleep. But as Jesus slept there and the waves gently rhythmically slapped against the side of the boat, that gentle wind started to pick up, started to get more intense, and those calm seas began to grow rocky, and the waves began to swell. The wind blew harder and harder, the waves grew higher and higher, but many of those, fish, many of those disciples were fishermen, they'd no doubt been through a lot of tough storms, so they weren't really nervous at first. They waited 
as the angry sea began to toss their boat more and more. But they were progressing across the lake. Yet nothing would stop this wind. It was growing, and the waves were surging until the waves were beginning to splash over the sides of the boat, and it ended up feeling like someone was shaking the lake like an earthquake. Until even those experienced fishermen could no longer keep calm because the waves were crashing into the boat, and the boat was beginning to fill up with water. Fear gripped their hearts with its talons and spoke in their ears, You are going to drown. And in all of this, somehow, Jesus is still sleeping. Jesus was still sleeping there in the back of the boat as the boat rocked. Maybe his face was even calm. It's like nothing could disturb Jesus. He was like a little child. Maybe you've seen a baby in a noisy room, but he's in his father's arms and he he can't even, it seems like he can't even hear anything. He's just quiet and asleep. Jesus was there, and I know that he was sleeping partially because he was exhausted. He was very fatigued, right? But I think that there's more to his slumber than his exhaustion. As Jesus lays there in the boat, he sleeps in peace. It seems like nothing can disturb him until. Teacher! One of the disciples comes to Jesus, terrified, fearing the storm. Maybe he's weeping, and he comes to Jesus, and he says, Teacher, I imagine him shaking Jesus awake. The disciple says, Teacher, don't you care that we are perishing? Jesus wakes up from his sleep and begins to look around at the storm. Maybe he's rubbing his eyes. And I see him stand up in the boat, and he extends his hands out to the wind and the waves, and he simply says, Peace, be still. And the wind dies down. And the waves begin to quiet. And he turns to his disciples and he said, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were so afraid at the storm. But when it talks about their response to this, it said, They greatly feared. Please notice that if you don't have a heart of peace, you live your life going from one fear to the next. And they said, oh, they greatly feared. And they said, what sort of man is this that even the wind and the waves obey? him?" Worshiping God in a restless world begins with a mindset of security. And the mindset of security drops down and begins to produce a heart of peace. A heart of peace. My family and I have this friend whose name uh, we'll call Sarah. And Sarah was like grew up as a Christian, um, but when she was in college, she was dating a young man who was not a believer. And she knew as a Christian she wasn't supposed to be in a relationship with an unbeliever. But she pursued this relationship and married this man. And they started to have children. They bought the house, you know. And after about six years of their marriage, they fell into a financial crisis, fell into a really hard time. And of course, she and Tice, her husband Tice, saw things very differently, right? About the sixth year of their marriage, they fell into a financial crisis. She had stopped working, the children were expensive, and Tice's small um, self-employed company was taking a turn for the worse. They watched in suspense as their financial crisis grew greater and greater. And in that, tice, in that time, Tice began to change. He began to become angrier. He was more irritable. He was harsh with the children. He began to work overtime, frantically trying to get more bids, trying to change something, but there was nothing he could do. However, Sarah at that time, though she stumbled sometimes, of course she wasn't perfect, but, but overall the Lord had given Sarah a divine calm in the midst of this difficulty. So much so that it actually started to make her husband angry. He actually started to get upset. One day he brought to her some more bad financial news of like one more thing that happened. I don't know what it was. And she received the news, news calmly and Tice blew up at her. He was like, what's wrong with you? Don't you see what's going on? You, we're about to go bankrupt and it's like you don't even care. And Sarah had to wait for a second. 
and calmly respond to her husband, and she had to explain to her husband, Ty, I trust in the Lord, and I am His, and I don't have to be afraid. Like her Savior, the Lord had given Sarah peace in the midst of the storm. How do we worship God in a restless world? It begins with a mindset of security, right? you got to know that God is your refuge. And He really is in control. Christian, do you believe that God is your refuge or not? Do you believe that He is in control of your life or not? Is He there or not? Do you have the mindset of security? Because when you know and you believe that truth that God is over your life, it starts to produce a heart of peace. A heart of peace. Look at verses 8 and 9 in Psalm 46. Verses 8 and 9 in Psalm 46 say, Come, behold the works of the Lord. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. God could end your problems in an instant. None of your problems are out of control to God. Nothing is overwhelming to the Lord. The Lord is God. He is the refuge over your life. Isn't this what what we see in Jesus, that heart of peace? This is why He could sleep in a storm, because He had the heart of peace, because He knew that His Father had control over His life and that nothing would befall Him that was outside of God's good plan. And because of his peace, the disciples actually misinterpreted him. The peace of God is confusing to those who don't have that peace, right? The disciples thought that Jesus was uncaring because of his peace. Tice thought that Sarah was out of touch or stupid or something because she had this peace. But really, Jesus and Sarah had the right emotion because they were safe in the middle of the storm. How do we have that? How do we worship in the restlessness? We worship by having a mindset of security, by having a heart of peace. And what's the actual action? What's the practical action of worship? Uh, Look in Psalm 46, verse 10. Psalm 46, verse 10. Just that first line there. Be still. And know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. In the end, we worship in the restless world by resting in God. By resting in God. It means you disengage from the frenzy of the world. It means you disconnect from the worries and from the constant struggle and from the striving, and from the pain, from the agonizing voice of fear. You unplug. You allow yourself to release from that. Resting in God. The big idea is this. You have to rest in God. In the knowledge, in your faith, in your peace in God, you allow your heart to rest. You allow your actions to rest. And how is this worship? How is this connected with worship? If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down also, because I believe this is from the Lord. How is it? This this is worship. This rest is worship because rest is our confession of God's rule. Because holy rest is our confession of God's rule. You can only truly rest when you know that you have an infinite protection. When you know that God really is your strength. That's the only way you can really rest. It's like you. It's like it takes you back to that state when you were a child, when you had full confidence in your mother or father. You can have that full confidence again. You can rest in God. Rest in Him. Because God's always working, I can rest. Because He's always protecting, I can let go of my self-protection. Because He's always in control, I can be out of control. You rest in God. What does that practically mean, Pastor Samuel? It could be as simple as shutting off your phone, right? (laughs) For a few hours every day or every week. It could be as simple as not answering emails or not getting back in text messages. It could mean taking a weekend retreat with no schedule. It can mean sleeping an extra hour when you really need it. 
taking that sick day when you're sick. It means embracing sacred stillness, right? It doesn't mean watching a TV show for five hours, right? <laughs> it means like pulling away and being still, doing what is still, just being with the Lord. Find a church that you don't know and go to a Saturday night worship service and just enjoy. Just sit in the back and just take it in. Just be still. Embrace the stillness in your life. Finally, in closing. When I say in closing, that's when you listen most closely. In closing. In closing, I think um, maybe there's a few of you that are listening to this sermon and the sermon is particularly for you. And you've been trained like since your infancy to be this the restless activist. And you just work, 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 work. You work so hard, right? But maybe you're getting to a point where you can't keep doing that. You're thin and you're tired and maybe you're emotionally oppressed and you're often sick. Or maybe you can keep doing that. Maybe, maybe you could keep going, but God is saying no and you know that. And right now in this moment, the Lord is calling you out of that ceaseless activism, but you're afraid. You're like so afraid afraid everything's going to fall and crash if you let go. Listen to me and believe. God is in control of your life. He will have his way. And you are safe. You don't have to fear the pestilence that stalks by night. The disaster at noonday. God is in control of your life. And even if the worst thing you could imagine happened, even in that, the Lord will care for you. And in the end, He will make it well. God is your refuge. He is your strength. He is in control. So let the storms come. Let the difficulties wage their wars. Because God is your refuge. He is your refuge. Come and rest. Lord Jesus, we receive our rest in you. We receive our rest in you. God, thank you that you are fighting for us while we sleep. And that you are scheming for our good when, we are, when we're not paying attention. And everything, everything is in your hands. Give us the true perspective. Give us eyes to see. Give us the grace to rest. And in our holy rest, to declare your strength and your rule. This is our worship. We choose to rest. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I think, uh, I think there's something going on in this church. I don't know about you. I think uh, the Lord is at work here. God's doing something. So thankful for his work, for the presence of the Lord with us in our worship and our preaching and everything. Yeah. I think one of my earliest memories when I was a little boy, um, when I was maybe... I had to be like two or three, probably. My, my father was working as a courier, as a package courier. He was delivering packages. It's like really hard work. He used to get up very early in the morning and go to a warehouse, collect packages, and then go deliver all day and come home in the evening, maybe at like seven or something like that. He was really tired. I remember being, this, I must have been very small. I remember being a little boy, and my dad was lying on the couch, and I remember like, walking over to my dad and based on my height now it would have been like up here right? walking over to my dad the couch and like crawling up on my dad and like laying down on his chest and just like uh, going to sleep there and just being present with my father in John 13 23 Jesus at the last supper uh, John is often referred to in the Gospel of John, as the disciple that Jesus loved. And as Jesus at the last, si last Supper, it said that John was reclining on Jesus' chest. The idea is like they're all, in the Middle East, they would be like at this table on the floor, and they were all kind of like propped up on their elbows, like on their left elbow like this. And then the person, the next person would be kind of like behind them, 
and like behind them at the table at the next spot and so on and so forth. And John was here and Jesus was like kind of behind him. And John was like right there kind of reclining in Jesus' chest, like close to him, like in that place, maybe kind of a place of rest. As the Lord calls us to rest, it's, it's like he's calling us to come climb up on the chest of your father, you know, to like recline with Jesus and to just be at peace with him and to know that you're safe there and that you are secure there. And it's so hard to do sometimes. <laughs> we, we get to this point where it's like we, we feel like we've left our childhood and our weakness behind us at moments, you know. Like we're past that, but we have to be able to continue to see ourselves as children and to be like children, for the kingdom of God belongs to children, and to be able to come and spend time with our Father and just to be still and to let go. I hope that you'll be able to take some time this week in the future in a new way to rest in God. Let me just close with this word from Jesus, just this one verse from John chapter 11, verse 28. Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Let me pray for you. Lord, I pray in the name of your Son, Jesus, that you would give this congregation rest. That you would give me rest, dear Lord, because I am very bad at resting often. <laughs> Teach us to rest, Lord, to rest in you. Tell us that you are in control again. Quiet our hearts like children. We receive your rest, Lord. You are our refuge. We declare your rule. Bless them this week. Watch over them in Jesus' name. Deliver them from their troubles. Give them rest. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.